Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture, which is the next to last lecture in the 27 lecture series on ethical issues in end of life care. Um, the final lecture will be given in this room next week by Dr. Linda Emanuel um, from Northwestern. And Dr. Emanuel's title is One Explorer's Map into the World of Palliative Care Chaplaincy Research. So if anybody knows chaplains around the hospital, pass that word along. Today, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. James Kirkpatrick. Uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick is an assistant professor of medicine and the physician co-chair of medical ethics at the University of Pennsylvania. Jim received his MD from Loma Linda University, then completed his internal medicine residency at Yale, New Haven Hospital, and came to the University of Chicago for fellowship training uh, in cardiology. Uh, Jim stayed on an extra year uh, as a senior fellow uh, to do an echocardiography program. Um, and while at the university, Dr. Kirkpatrick also completed fellowship training uh, at the McLean Center in clinical medical ethics. Jim is the co-chair of the Palliative Care Working Group of Geriatric Cardiology uh, in the American College of Cardiology. He also serves as a volunteer physician at Esperanza Health Clinic, a federally qualified underserved clinic in North Philadelphia. Jim's research interests include ethical issues around cardiac arrest, advanced directives, in end-stage cardiovascular disease and echocardiography. His publications include, uh, I'll just read you a couple of titles, Bundling Informed Consent and Advanced Care Planning in Chronic Cardiovascular Disease. Another one, Deactivation of Implantable cardiovert Cardioverted Defibrillators in Terminal Illness and End-of-Life Care. Some of you heard that talk at the McLean Conference last year and an, another publication in Lancet, Medical Ethics and the Art of Cardiovascular Medicine. Today, Dr. Kirkpatrick's talk is entitled, Last Exit Off the Cardiac Freeway, Ethical Considerations in Palliative Care and Cardiovascular Implantable Electronic Devices. Please join me to welcome warmly Jim Kirkpatrick. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate the opportunity. I want to thank Mark and also Dan for inviting me to uh, come back to the McLean Center and talk to you today about this, uh, including some work that, that we and others have actually done in the field. Um, a lot of my ways of thinking uh, about medicine in general were highly influenced by my time at the McLean Center and uh, obviously during my cardiology fellowship here. And I, I really went into cardiology thinking of ways to try to meld those two fields. And hopefully I'll be able to convince you that despite what it may look like on the surface, they're not as far off as, as necessarily one would think. So I do have uh, some disclosures. I try to stay away from affiliations with commercial entities and doing ethics that's not entirely difficult to do. So ethics tends not to pay all that much when it comes to industry. Um, but obviously I'm an employee at Penn Medicine, which may have its own uh, things associated with it, and I've received some salary support uh, from the NIH and honoraria uh, from the American Society of Echo. So I want to start with a quote. This is, came out in the uh, New York Times Magazine. This is an academic who was writing about her experience and her family's experience with a pacemaker and her uh, parents, uh, her elderly and demented father, had had a pacemaker place. And she says, the pacemaker bought my parents two years of limbo, two years of purgatory, and two years of hell. If we did nothing, his pacemaker would not stop for years, like the tireless charmed brooms in Disney's Fantasia. It would prompt my father's heart to beat after he became too demented to speak, sit up, or eat. And one of the things that was disturbing about this is that the cardiologist when approached with this question, could we just turn off the pacemaker and let him die in peace, said, absolutely not. We can't do that. That would be akin to euthanasia. 
So here's where I hope that we can go today along, along our freeway. Well, first of all, I want to talk about the devices in general, because I know that perhaps not everyone here is entirely familiar with what we're talking about, but it'll be brief. And then I want to talk about the complexity of deactivation of these devices and argue that it's not quite the same as what we think about for some of the other things that we routinely withdraw. And finally, I want to talk about advanced care planning and palliative care in patients with these devices and share some of the data that has come out on that. So just to start out with, this is a picture here of a dual chamber pacemaker. You'll note that pacemakers actually consist of um, this basically little computer here that's implanted inside the muscle in the upper chest in most cases. And it has these leads which are put into the veins and they go through the veins and down into the right side of the heart. You can have a lead in the left, in the right uh, atrium here, the top part of the heart, and a lead in the right ventricle. Or you could just have a lead in the right ventricle. Theoretically, you could just have a lead in the right atrium too. It kind of depends on exactly what the conduction system problem is. But you can pace this part, you can pace this part, and basically restore con electrical conduction to a heart that uh, doesn't have it. And there's various different indications for this. And here's a dual chamber ICD. Again, you can have two different leads here. You can have one in the right atrium, one in the right ventricle, but really the one in the right ventricle is the one that we're talking about. And if you'll notice here in this schematic drawing, um, up here we just have a nice smooth blue thing, but here you can see these sort of striated patterns. And what that is trying to convey is the fact that you have this larger lead in the right ventricular apex because it actually can shock. So this one, act this one will pace, and this one will both pace and deliver an electrical shock, and that's what gets people out of these terminal heart rhythm problems. And then the other thing that we're talking about here is what's called a cardiac resynchronization device or a biventricular defibrillator. And you can see it's quite similar with the exception that there's an extra lead here that goes through the coronary sinus, the vein of the heart. It's basically inserted backwards, backwards the way the flow goes. And you can get it down into a vein on the side of the left side of the heart. So this is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle. And it, we can now pace both sides of the heart at the same time, or actually what we do is pace them at a slightly different delay. But what this does is it not only restores sort of electrical conduction when there isn't good electrical conduction, but it can actually also allow these two sides of the heart to beat at the right time in relation to each other. Because a lot of times what happens in patients who have very sick hearts is that they're really unable to have coordinated contractions between those two ventricles, and even within the left ventricle, this part, the septum here, and the lateral wall cannot contract at the same time. And so what we can do is actually restore that contraction with this uh, biometricular device. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details about these, but essentially a single or dual chamber pacemaker can be indicated for bradycardia or very slow heart rate when the patient is actually not feeling very well because of a slow heart rate. Or they can have various forms of heart block, some of which can be completely lethal and they really need a pacemaker to, to survive. They may actually not be symptomatic, but we might find that on the EKG that there's this heart block and that would be an indication for a pacemaker. And then in rare cases, we need to give them a medicine that slows the heart rate down, but if we do that and they already have bradycardia, then they'll start getting lightheaded or dizzy or going to heart block, and then we put in this pacemaker just as a backup device so that allows us to give these other medicines. The implantable cardioverter defibrillator, ICD, really just does one thing, and that's shock the heart into a, uh, into a good rhythm. Now, it is true that there are other ways to get back into a normal rhythm. Sometimes it can start pacing really fast and then abruptly stop pacing, and the heart will go back into normal rhythm and sometimes. But the bottom line is it just treats the abnormal heart rhythms that are coming from the bottom part of the heart. But there are two types of indications for this. One is called primary prevention. And that is a patient who has not actually had an event. They haven't actually had a bad heart rhythm, which has uh, caused them to pass out or uh, have sudden cardiac death. And then there's secondary prevention, which they've already had that, and now we put this in to prevent it from happening again. And then cardiac resynchronization therapy with biventricular pacemaker. Um, and usually we have a defibrillator put with that, so it is sort of a combo device. And that can prevent cardiac death both from bad heart rhythms, but also from progressive deterioration of the pumping function. And what we showed actually before that happened was we can improve symptoms of heart failure. So that's basically our brief overview of, of if you will, the freeways that we're talking about today. 
So what this means, I think, particularly from the ethical standpoint when we're thinking about this, is that a pacemaker is life prolonging in some cases and can treat these symptoms and other symptoms in other cases. The defibrillator is life prolonging, but it really doesn't do anything else. Um, it, in fact, if you get an unnecessary shock, it can be quite distressing and painful. And then the CRT devices, they can be life prolonging and treat the heart failure symptoms, and they can actually improve something called the left ventricular ejection fraction and measure the pumping function of the left side of the heart. So you can do a lot of different things here, and it, obviously you have to have the right indication for when you get your device. So I want to remind everybody what it's like for a heart failure patient. This is a, a diagram that was developed by Sarah Goodland back in 2004, and it kind of illustrates what a lot of heart failure patients go through. So they get diagnosed with heart failure, they come in short of breath, lightheaded, feeling terrible, and then they get on good medical therapy and they get onto this plateau phase. And they can go a long time feeling well or they can go a short time. This is really unclear how long this is going to be, but eventually they're going to start deteriorating. They might come into the hospital or just the emergency room, get a little bit of medicine treatment, then they get back on this for an unspecified period of time, but eventually they're going to start having their functional status decline again and again. They're going to come back in the hospital, and back in the hospital, and back in the hospital. At that point, they're usually candidates for what are called advanced cardiac therapies, and that may be transplant or something called a ventricular assist device. It's already been talked about in, in this setting. And that might put them back on this, um, this plateau for quite a while. But eventually, we all die, and that's basically what number five is here. At any point along here, they can have an arrhythmia that could kill them, and they are predisposed to that. So they obviously defibrillators can treat these and prevent that from happening. So this is essentially what they're doing here. If we think about them, a little car thing, they're going through that. All right. Now, along the way, heart failure patients don't just have these traditional symptoms of dyspnea, chest pain, edema, or swelling the ankles, fatigue, and inability to exercise. They tend to be older, so they have all of these other things too. They can have gout and muscle cramps and nausea. And obviously, when they are critically ill and chronically ill, they end up with a lot of psychosocial and spiritual issues as well. And then, of course, all of the social and functional issues. And these are all things that are documented in heart failure patients to be really quite common. But one of the more disturbing things is the fact that, as I mentioned, there's this plateau phase. We don't know how long it's going to last, but we also don't know when things are going to start getting worse. We have a lot of ways of measuring the risk in heart failure patients. But the reality is we are much more in this uncertain opportunity. That is the exit we're taking a lot of time with these patients. There's a lot less of this, and this tends to be more common, and we think about this in other diseases like dementia and, and cancer, but this is the life that heart failure patients live a lot of the time. And that creates a lot of problems as you're planning your life and thinking about uh, advanced care planning as well. And then there's this uncomfortable reality. I love this quote here. This was actually a letter to the editor in the British Medical Journal, and it was back from a different era in which we were just starting to do percutaneous coronary angioplasty, blowing up a balloon inside of blocked coronary arteries. And he was basically right. We rescue people from a relatively sudden death from myocardial infarction, but we inflict on them a more prolonged death from progressive heart failure. And I would argue that this is even more true now in our era of defibrillators. And, and pacemakers is that we are actually, we can save people and bring them back, but we are in a sense taking away their chance to die quickly, quickly and painlessly, which was a quote that I learned as I was training here. Uh, Brad Knight, who is the former uh, head of the electrophysiology department, tells all of his patients this. Now, not the younger people necessarily, but certainly all the older ones. You have to think about this as you're getting your defibrillator because there are meaning, there's meaning to this device that's just beyond us putting in there and aborting sudden cardiac death. So let's talk a little bit about deactivation. When is it okay to unplug? Um, now here I want to actually have, do a little audience participation. So I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and answer these questions. And I will give you the caveat that these are very generalized questions. They are not very nuanced, but hopefully they will generate a little discussion. Uh, if you don't have a neighbor, then you can sort of think about them yourself. I'll just give you two minutes to think about this. But so the first question, is it ethical to turn off the shocking function of an ICD, the thing that can actually cause pain when it, when it shocks someone? And is it ethical when it's requested by a patient or surrogate to do that? So talk amongst yourselves for 30 seconds, and then I'll give you the next question.
All right, so now I'm going to give you the next question. Is it ethical to turn off the shocking function of an ICD against a patient or surrogate's wishes if ICD function is deemed to be futile? It's a very good question. Two doctors have said this is futile to continue the ICD function. All right. Is it ethical to turn off a pacemaker in these same cases? And, for that matter, does it matter if the patient is pacemaker dependent, i.e., if they don't have the action of the pacemaker, they'll die. They won't actually if get lightheaded or feel bad. They'll actually die without it. And the implicit question here is, is this different than the ICD? All right. Keep those thoughts in your mind. I want to acknowledge the, uh, the legal foundation that I had uh, during the McLean Center Fellowship, which was absolutely wonderful. And uh, Frona Daskal and Ann Dudley Goldblatt did an amazing job of teaching us the, the legal basis for the ethics that we were talking about here. And just to remind everyone, there's been a number of very high profile cases over the years, dating back to the early part of, of uh, the 1900s, that essentially established somewhat gradually in steps this right to withhold and withdraw therapy, particularly when it comes to the patient or the authorized surrogate actually doing that. So we really had right to bodily integrity and right to consent equals right to not consent, informed consent uh, ideas that came in the Salgo case, the right to withdraw extraordinary uh, treatments, whatever that means, the idea of substituted judgment, but also contrasting that with some state interests, and then of course the right to refuse uh, therapies, and mostly a lot of these were talking about feeding tubes, of course. Now, it turns out that deactivating a defibrillator or a pacemaker is a relatively easy thing to do. All you really have to do is take this little computer-like device, it's hooked up to this wand, you put it over the device in the upper chest, you don't have to poke them, you don't have to do anything, you just set it over there and you turn, tell this thing to turn it off and there you go. Or, if you don't have one of these nifty programmers, which by the way used to be sold on eBay, which is a little disturbing, but they, they actually took that off, um, you can just put a magnet over a defibrillator and it will inhibit the shocking function and the patient will not get shocked. So obviously you have to tape it down or so it doesn't fall off, but that's, that's really all it is, is required. But it's really not so easy, and after all, maybe physically easy, but it's not so easy in other ways. This is a, a really a landmark paper that was done. It's a rather simple um, study. They basically looked at, um, they called up uh, 100 um, next of kin of patients with ICDs who had actually died, and they talked to them kind of about what was the discussion that went on at the end of life about the ICD and what to actually do with it. And, and out of these 100, basically only 27 reported that physicians had ever discussed deactivation before the patient died. And they only did so right before the patient died. And interestingly, there, there were eight patients who received a shock from their ICD just minutes before death. Now, that, you know, this was a phone call that was retrospective. It wasn't confirmed by interrogating the devices and finding out what actually happened. But this was the family's perception about what had actually occurred. And it was disturbing because all of these people were dying, and yet they were, eight of them were subjected to these painful shocks in the last days of their life. And that was pretty much because nobody bothered talking about this. And there may have been more shocks that people didn't know about. But it really spurned a lot of, of interest in this. Now, one of the other barriers, of course, has been the whole death panel debate. And this idea that if we actually talk about death, that we're actually causing it. And I just have a problem with that, theoretically and ethically and everything else. But I, I think this has really raised questions in the minds of the, the public about what we're doing. And, created a lot of, of confusion about that. So when we actually looked at providers and asked them some of these questions, this is one of the things, one of the studies that really got me interested in this from the very early on. You'll notice this is from 2003 in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. And basically, it was, it was a very small study. They basically identified just a handful of patients who had an ethics consult. And the ethics consult was the family or the patient wanted to deactivate their pacemaker or defibrillator. And the clinicians did not want to do that. And so you can see what happened. Uh, you know, they looked at the advanced directives being consistent with the, uh, the request to do it. And all of them were, and one patient didn't have one. And uh, in various cases, though, the patients died before the device could be deactivated. In a handful of cases, there was. And, 
And there was a lot of issues that came out of this, but it became very clear that the electrophysiologists were very uncomfortable deactivating these devices. So uh, um, Nathan Goldstein, who had done that other study, also did a follow-up qualitative study looking at some of these issues. So he interv interviewed some internists and some cardiologists and got some very interesting quotes out of this. One male cardiologist said, turning off a defibrillator, it's like crossing a bridge. It's like saying, you know, we've gone so far and we can go and you're not going to need this down the road you're traveling and we're going to shut it off. There's a finality to actually shutting it off. They were clearly uncomfortable with this. A female electrophysiologist says, well, I don't know. I, I think it makes it easier because, turning it off because it's a sort of a random event in a sense. You turn off the defibrillator, you don't know when they're going to develop a bad heart rhythm that will kill them. That you know by turning off the switch, you're not actually killing the person. So this is kind of the other, the other side of the coin. A little bit more comfortable with this because turning it off is not killing the patient. It's allowing the patient's underlying disease to actually supersede. And then a female internist. I think people just don't think of turning off things that we already started. Even though it's like all technology, even though we say ethically and legally there's no difference between withholding and drawing, withdrawing, I think for a lot of life-sustaining therapies, and it's interesting to use that term in talking about defibrillators, in practice it seems like it's different. And I love this quote because when we think about these things on the ethics consult service in, in ethics debates, a lot of time we throw this out that it's no difference ethically and legally, but for the person at the bedside, for the family, and for the clinicians, that's not always the case. And I think it's important that we recognize that. Dan Kramer, who's uh, up in Boston, actually did a quantitative study in follow-up with this. So he actually asked some clinicians and asked them whether they viewed pacemaker ICD withdrawal as different than chest compressions during CPR, mechanical ventilation, dialysis, and feeding tubes. And you can see that there were differential answers to this. So when they, when they asked about pacemakers, a lot fewer of them actually thought that there was uh, similarities between withdrawing of the pacemakers. They were more likely to view ICDs as being similar to withdrawing some of these other things. And then these are, this is actually a graph showing the percentage of physicians who lack comfort discussing IC, uh, therapy, therapeutic withdrawal. So it, most people, except for 10%, uh, were very comfortable withdrawing mechanical ventilation, feeding tubes are less so, dialysis. But look at where ICDs and pacemakers, either in pacemaker-dependent or pacemaker-independent patients, actually rank. There are a lot more people who are uncomfortable discussing withdrawal of these devices than some of the more standard you could say standard things that we think about withdrawing. Now we actually went, and it, implicit in those questions also is, is there a difference between ICDs and pacemakers? And we actually sent a survey out to members of the Heart Rhythm Society, which is in sort of an international uh, body. We got um, sent out via email here, and I'm sorry you can't see the percentages very well, but we actually asked them this question. Is there an ethical and moral difference between deactivating the shocking function in an ICD and deactivating pacemaker function in the pacemaker-dependent patient? And a lot of them felt like there was. There was an intrinsic difference between the, even these two cardiovascular implantable electronic device therapies. Now, the Heart Rhythm Society actually came out with an expert consensus statement in 2010 because they recognized that there was great consternation among their members and just about everybody else in dealing with this. So they actually came out very clearly and reiterated many of the, the same ethical issues that we have been talking about. Legally and ethically, there's no difference between deactivating the CIED, that's the cardiovascular implantable electronic device, um, and withdrawal. There's, there's no difference. Ethically, deactivation is not physician-assisted suicide. It is not euthanasia. And it's, therefore, as a matter of fact, no treatment, including these therapies, has a unique ethical or legal status. And a clinician, however, cannot be compelled to do something they don't think is ethically or legally permissible and, and conflicts with their personal values. So all of these sort of standard things that we talk about in ethics were, were very much uh, stated strongly by the, the HRS in this statement. So that may have settled the issue for some clinicians, or at least they were told that it should be settled. But what about patients? They don't read our guidelines for the most part. And again, uh, Goldstein did the same sort of thing in asking patients in this qualitative survey. So he talked uh, to patients, and one of the patients um, said that if you turn off a device, it's, it's like an act of suicide. It's a threat to your life. That's like cardiac arrest. 
That's insane. This person had never been shocked. They'd had their ICD for about a year. But people were very uncomfortable talking about device deactivation. These, in fact, there were only a few quotes that he could glean from people because they didn't want to talk about it. And again, Kramer did the same sort of thing from a quantitative aspect and asked, is deactivation morally similar in pacemaker, ICD, and then this is the non-dependent. Uh, non if your pacemaker isn't working, you won't die. You may just feel worse. And again, we see that pacemakers and ICDs are actually viewed quite differently in relation to other these things that we talk about withdrawing. From their study, they found that many patients characterized deactivation of pacemakers or ICDs as euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide. It was a minority, but it was a substantial minority. And then over 50% didn't know what the law said about that, which actually doesn't say anything, but that's, they were uh, concerned about, about that uh, potentially being illegal to do that. So we actually, in a separate survey of device patients um, in our uh, clinic at the University of Pennsylvania, we said, in general, what should be done with ICDs if you were in an end-of-life situation and you had a DNR? Now, a lot of people said deactivate, but there were a substantial minority that said keep it on or it depends. And we asked, what about if the patient's going to hospice? And you can, it's interesting, keeping the ICD on actually got more responses at that point, which is a bit odd. And maybe there was some confusion about what hospice meant, but... We thought it was relatively clear, but I still think that there's a, there's a lot of difficulty here in understanding uh, these devices. There, there's a lot of uncertainty, just like this um, near where I live at this point. Here's, is it what, two miles or is it one mile? It's the same exit. I'm not sure exactly how that happens. But anyway, you know, this is what patients are, are dealing with when they're talking about these different things. So does this constitute letting nature take its course, like that female electrophysiologist said? We, we turn off the ICD, and what happens, happens. Is it actually prolonging death? Are we shocking people repeatedly? Hurts most of the time, and we're just keeping them alive for no good reason. They're going to die anyway. Is it potentially, if we turn it off, are we preventing unnecessary suffering? I think all these things patients could, could understand and, and think about. But one of the more intriguing questions I find is, what is the actual meaning of the device? What does this device mean? We've had patients who have really have given a name to their device because it's, it's part of them. It's something that they identify with. It's, one patient actually said, well, it, you know, it never did me any wrong. Why would I turn it off? As if you were harming the device by turning it off. It's, it's very interesting. So you know, when we talk about meaning, there's, there's actually work uh, that has come out of the McLean Center on this. Um, uh, some former fellows a long time ago actually uh, came up with this concept of the ICD of pacemakers a biofixture. And essentially, the idea is that uh, it's sort of like property. And so the person who has it in there can determine whether or not it should be deactivated or not deactivated, kind of like chattel. You sort of get to define what it is based on, on what you would like because it's your property, it's inside of you. And um, England and England actually came up with this idea of an integral device, which is kind of similar to this idea that it's actually in your body and and uh, perhaps it has a special status then that, that uh, you should think about before deactivating. It's not like uh, pulling out a, an endotracheal tube and stopping the ventilator. But by far, I think, the most nuanced discussion of this was actually done uh, by Dan. And it was very interesting. I don't know Dan very well, but I'm, this, was a, this was basically an editorial that was written on another paper. And from everything I know about Dan, he's able to in a, just an editorial a comment on somebody else's paper, come up with groundbreaking, incredibly insightful things that now everybody references instead of the original paper. So that's basically what's happened. And in considering this idea of withholding and withdrawing, he came up with this idea of substitutive versus replacement therapy. And there's a distinction between the two. So continuous and intermittent is one sort of category, way that you can think about it. Regulative and constitutive, is it sort of resetting things or is it actually keeping the person alive? And then what is just brilliant from the patient's perspective here is, is it inside of you or is it outside of you? Because we, send, we tend to think of things in, as similar, but really the patient sees that there's a difference there. And has the patient incorporated this as themselves or do they see it as not being themselves? But really the substitutive versus replacement therapy also can be categorized in regards to whether this device itself is actually responsive to its environment. Now, for pacemakers, you could sort of argue that it is. It monitors the heart rhythm and then it does something, both pacemakers and ICDs, so it's kind of responsive. 
does that have the, the opportunity to grow or self-repair? Not at this point, um, not like a, a transplant. A transplanted organ does have, have capability of doing that, but a device does not at this point. Uh, does it have independence of an energy source? Definitely not. These things have batteries. The batteries wear out. We have to replace them. Is it independent from external control? As the devices are getting better, they are, but we can always reprogram them, and in a sense, if they start malfunctioning, we have to put that wand on there and reprogram it. So kind of, kind of not. And then this idea of immunological compatibility, um, you know, that certainly they, in some sense, are sort of that way. They're generally not attacked by the body, but um, that's the case. And then this idea of physical integration, again, is this really fully part of the person or is it not? So I, this is really the most nuanced dealing with this, and I encourage all of you to, to read this if you are interested in it at all. So, um, you know, based on this, we actually, in our, again, survey of these electrophysiology professionals, wanted to ask them a number of questions. And unfortunately, this was an online survey. We didn't have a chance to, to be as comprehensive as what uh, Dan had did and include all of his, his things here. But we, we wanted to try to give them a way to answer this question. So is a pacemaker a pacemaker-dependent patient um, like nothing else? Is it like a coronary stent that you just kind of put in there and it becomes part of the body? And, is it applied therapy, like an external defibrillation during a code situation? Or is it something that's just kind of keeping you alive, like dialysis? Now, obviously, there's a huge problem here because dialysis intermittently, um, you know, you, you plug someone up to the dialysis machine, and then you take it off. And that's very different than an, an ICD. But we were struggling to find something that they could answer quickly. And they found, uh, they at least, the majority of them thought that, oops, excuse me, that it actually was most like dialysis, although you can see quite a heterogeneity of responses. Um, now, this const is really different than what they talked about with ICDs. ICDs, they thought that they were not like any other intervention, at least a plurality of them said that. So again, this sort of theme that ICDs and pacemakers have some kind of moral or ethical difference, at least in, the, in terms of withdrawing them. So obviously, when we talk about deactivation, this is why I asked you that question, is what about unilateral deactivation? We have unilateral DNR. Um, in 1999, Texas passed a, uh, an advanced directive statute that basically laid out a process from which you could say, this patient is, is, uh, really should not receive any more care. They're futile. At least we shouldn't be coding them at this point. And if you go through this process, which involves ethics consultation and discussion with physicians and that sort of thing, you can say, all right, unilaterally, we are not going to code this patient. Well. It kind of makes sense then, if they have a defibrillator in, if you're not going to code them from the outside, why would you code them from the inside? So, you know, and this has become much more important in, eras of, in the era of cost consciousness. ICU beds are a scarce resource. If someone's getting shocked every other day and keeping them there when they're taking up a bed, and then this, uh, someone pointed out this idea of futile care, whatever that means, but we throw that around a lot, at least at the University of Pennsylvania. So um, this actually was, was discussed somewhat um, and quantified, now there's a lot of problems with trying to put a dollar value on anything, but in this study they actually suggested that there was a substantial cost to the hospital uh, in these thousand plus patients uh, for those who had care that was deemed futile and they, and they basically were kept going. And it was, it was a substantial uh, amount, 3.5% of the total hospital costs for, for these patients. So it's not a trivial amount of money that we're talking about. So we actually wanted to address this issue with our electrophysiology professionals, and so we actually asked them straight up, is it ethical or moral to deactivate an ICD against patient and family wishes? And the majority of them said no, but you'll see that 18% said yes. And we asked patients the same question. Again, device patients in the clinic, there were only 60 of them in the study, but a fairly similar number also said that this was, was not ethical or moral to do that. One person actually said, that's not physician-assisted suicide, that's physician-assisted homicide. So it's, it's interesting because there may be legal, you know, it's, to my knowledge, this has not been tried in the courts at this particular point about whether unilateral deactivation is allowed. But, you know, if you go under this uh, statute, um, this, or this idea, this uh, opinion that actually came out from Justice Cordozo in 1914 at the New York Supreme Court, that every human being of adult years has sound mind has the right to determine what shall be done uh, with his or her own body, that putting this on someone's body and deactivating the device that's inside could constitute battery. And you could probably, not, certainly if someone died, you might be tried for homicide, but 
uh, it could definitely at least constitute battery or unwanted, unwarranted touching. Now, the interesting thing is we now have the ability to program these devices without touching the patient, basically through the airwaves. Now, does that constitute battery? Kind of depends how you see the device, right? So to kind of wrap up here to some extent, I do want to talk about advanced care planning and bring the palliative care aspect in here and talk about this with cardiovascular devices in particular. And again, restricting it to the electronic uh, rhythm monitoring devices. So we, in our same survey of our device patients, we asked them, in regards to your ICD at the end of your life, have you actually considered what you want done with it or what should be done with it? And of course, the vast majority of them said no. Have you discussed this with a medical practitioner? And even a greater percentage said, of course not. Never have had this discussion at all with, with my doctor about it. And actually, this is quite similar to what others have found, too. The bottom line is that physicians rarely discuss the activation of ICDs and pacemakers. And patients don't really think about this. They don't put it in their advanced directive. Why should we consider this thing is saving my life? And some of it, I think, is this. My advanced directive is for you not to show up. But I think it's also patients would be fine with talking about it. And that's what we found in our thing, too. They, they don't mind talking about this, just long they don't mind talking about advanced directives. And of course, advanced directives are not the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Not enough patients have them. As you all know, about only about 30% of patients nationally have it. Now, it tends to go up if you have chronic cardiovascular disease or some other disease or if you're older. But the reality is not enough people have it. And if they do have it, as we've seen, they don't mention what to do with the devices. And there are a lot of complex choices that are not covered in the standard living will. Do you want you know, all the full court press at the end of life? Well, what does that mean, especially with a device patient? We don't know. Motion does absolutely play a role in this. And of course, there are changing goals of care as people go through their life course. They might have different ideas. So you know, I agree with Helsky. It's really about the conversation that needs to be had. And the reality is, uh, really something that, that the HRS document laid out very early on, and that is we need to start having these conversations early. So they, they even gave some helpful phrases to consider right before implant of the device and what to talk them, points to cover and things to actually talk about in advanced care planning. You know, it seems clear that at this point the device is in your best interest, but you should know at some point if you become very ill or another process, the burden of the device might outweigh the benefits and basically we can turn it off at that point. After an episode in which you get lots of firings from the ICD, again, time to readdress this issue. I know that your device caused you some recent discomfort and you were quite distressed. Progression of the disease, underlying disease, even if you're not getting shocked by it or you're having other arrhythmias or now you have heart failure symptoms. It looks like things are not going well. We should talk about what to do. When the patient or surrogate chooses a DNR order. Now, this is really the time when we need to think about whether we want to shock internally, if we're shocking externally. And of course, at the very end of life, if it's not already covered by these other uh, uh, sections, and we need to maybe even suggest that it's time to deactivate. So really, as, as Sarah Goodland has laid out very nicely, changing in physical exam or findings of the test is a time to talk about this new or worsening symptoms, need for another, yet another intervention such as you're getting shocked all the time, now we have to add a medicine to keep you from getting shocked all the time. Maybe this is the time to rethink it. Complication of the device therapy or side effect. And of course, if you develop cancer or dementia or something, it might be time to think about this. So the way I like to think about this, really goals of care discussion should be like elections in Chicago and for that matter, Philadelphia. We need to do it early and we need to keep doing it. And I don't, what do we do then? Right? So we know that the, the standard living will thing isn't going to work. That is not going to be specific enough. Now, I think we need to have some specific discussions about this. And you probably need an electrophysiologist to help you because it depends on what the patient's underlying rhythm is and how the device is set and what the shocking threshold, all these different aspects are. But we need to talk about discontinuation, what to do with DNR, what to do when go into hospice. ATP is anti-tachycardia pacing. How do we you know, do that? Maybe we do that and not shock. If that doesn't work, we let you go, that sort of thing. Pacemakers and quality of life versus life prolongation. Again, this idea of pacemaker dependence, they're going to die without it, or do they have it in there just to make them feel better? If they're making them feel better and you turn it off, even if they're in hospice, that doesn't make any sense. Why make them suffer? It may or may not prolong their life, and there's some data to suggest it doesn't unnecessarily. And these CRT or biventricular devices, they improve quality of life. You might turn off the shocking function, but why would you turn that off if they're actually feeling better? I don't think it has to be like a menu. 
choose one of this and one of that and whatever. I think we can integrate this whole thing, find out the patient's goals and values, and then come up with a plan of what to do with the device in consultation with them. And in fact, Keith Sweats from the Mayo Clinic and now at the University of Alabama Birmingham has come up with this very nice model. He did not do this for ICDs or CRT devices or pacemakers. He did this for left ventricular assist devices. But I think it works in this setting too because it's kind of all the same stuff. If you have device failure, if you're getting shocked unnecessarily, what should we do at that point? Because that may happen. What should we do if you have a catastrophic complication due to something else going on? You have a stroke or something like that. What if your quality of life is just bad, even despite your cardiac resynchronization therapy? Or what if you develop dementia or cancer? Let's think about this before the device goes in and start the conversation. And in fact, this is nothing new. And you'll notice here when this was actually written. Now, Mark participated in this document way back when. And thank goodness, because I'm not sure we, we a cardiologist would have come up with this on our own. But they've said very strongly way back then that all of us should be involved in providing high quality of end of life care, preserving dignity, relieving suffering. Palliative care should be a priority. And we should be involved in advanced care planning. And the reality is that doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. But patients also know this is the right thing. When we asked our device patients about this, who do you want to talk about your advanced directive for your ICD? Most of them said the cardiologist or the electrophysiologist. Very smaller numbers said the primary care physician. Now, I would argue that the primary care physician should be involved in it. But as far as the, the specifics about what to do with the device, it really does require subspecialty involvement. But the problem is that oftentimes palliative care and ethics and cardiology are going two different directions on the freeway, right? And we have this divider right in between. So palliative care and ethics, we talk about low-tech things, right? Advanced directive is not, not really automated at, at this point. It doesn't have any technology associated with it. Humanistic focus, it's clearly difficult to study. Uh, supportive care is important. Quality of life is a major metric. It's very inexpensive. We talk about things like the good death. Now, in cardiology, we are high tech as much as any other subspecialty. We are very mechanically oriented. We are data driven. If it's not proven, we don't do it. Interventions are where we make our money. So that's obviously important. Life prolongation is also where we make our money. And it's very costly as a result. And rather than talking about the good death, we talk about let's just give him or her a chance at life. We don't care about the quality of life, but we want him to, to stay alive. And what we need here is this beautiful case of the Dan Ryan. Everything is going in the same direction, and there's no traffic, right? Because this is the way it is all the time going into downtown. That's what we need, everybody going in the same direction. And I, I'm happy to report that that is happening finally. We have this palliative care working group as part of the ACC section of geriatric cardiology. There are a number of very prominent academics who are dual trained in palliative care and in cardiology. Uh, Kellyanne Light McGrory at uh, the University of Iowa, Sarah Co or, um, uh, Stephanie Cooper at the University of Washington. And this is, this is actually going forward, fortunately. And why is this important? Well, palliative care, defined sort of very broadly from the World Health Organization, talks about things like improving quality of life, preventing and relieving suffering, early identification and assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, addressing physical, psychosocial, and spiritual issues. Well, guess what heart failure patients have? They've got all of this. Why shouldn't palliative care be a priority in these patients? Well, it should be. So we need to go from this. This is the old model of thinking about palliative care, which I think most of us in cardiology still have. In fact, some of my colleagues, I've told them that this is no longer the model. I've told them again and again and again, and they keep saying that this is what, well, I guess we're going to hospice now because there's nothing else to do. Or get palliative care on board because now we're, we're done. That's not the way to think about it. We don't stop here and go to hospice. What we do instead, and this is the way we need to change it, is we have life prolonging care continues, but palliative care starts early and keeps going, and perhaps the ratios change over time. <clears throat> you may eventually get to the point where you go to hospice and the patient dies, and then, of course, bereavement uh, care is incredibly important in hospice. But you have these two things happening at the same time. They are not incompatible. So essentially, I think what we have here is the opportunity, as the patient's going along, to have the palliative care intervention go along with the patient and make this ride a little less bumpy. And you can see where I think they need to come in. If, they don't, if not here, then certainly somewhere on the plateau phase 
and not necessarily when they're out here at number five. So in my humble opinion, what we really need is several things. We need primary prevention palliative care, and that really is probably the cardiologist finally getting involved with this. And preparedness planning, I think Keith Sweats has got the idea, and Mark mentioned an article that we wrote um, in JAMA Internal Medicine, this idea of bundling advanced care planning and informed consent all at the same time. Because ultimately, advanced care planning is informed consent, right? We're going to put this thing in, and yes, there's a certain number of uh, percentage of complications that you might have, bleeding, infection, and death, but the other part of informed consent is at some point, this may stop working for you, and we need to think about what to do at that point. Palliative care and ethics, we need to think of this not as the passive and do nothing and, you know, well, at the end of the line. These are actually interventionalists, right? We have cardiovascular interventionalists. They're putting stents in people left and right and putting in all these devices and new valves that are put in through the veins and the arteries and that sort of thing. Well, palliative care needs to be thought of as being interventional. And we have this idea in cardiology when someone's having an, a heart attack that they need to get into the cath lab and get that artery opened up and there's a certain door to a balloon time. And if you're over 90 minutes door to balloon time, then the patient's quality of life and their, their chance of living is worse. We need to have a door to advanced care planning time when they come into the hospital and start thinking about it in that way. And we need to have more cardiovascular specialists as trained as ethicists, and we need to have them thinking about doing palliative care more often. But this requires education and training. And there's a number of initiatives underway. There's something called CardioTalk, which is basically based on this idea of OncoTalk from the oncology world, and that's being done actively. There was actually a presentation at the last American College of Cardiology uh, from the uh, people at University of Pittsburgh who had a weekend training seminar rated extremely highly by all the cardiovascular practitioners who went through it. They're really teaching them communication skills at the end of life. And we need to have new models for advanced care planning cardiology. I believe very strongly we need to empower inpatient nurses to do this. Now, they don't necessarily have to write the DNR order. They don't have to necessarily sit there while the patient fills out the advanced directive, but they can bring up the issues. They can help the guide the patients into some of these decision-making things. I think that will help our advanced directive percentages quite a bit. And one of the things we're really struggling with now is, you know, we have an outpatient oncology palliative care clinic. We have nothing like that for cardiology, and I think that's what we need. We need more outpatient palliative care. Again, that allows it to happen earlier in the process. I think that would be very helpful. Because ultimately, this is the exit that we want patients to come off of. We want them to come off and have hope. Maybe not hope that they're going to survive, but certainly hope that they're going to have their symptoms treated and somebody's going to walk with them during the end. And I just want to leave you with this final quote, which I, I share a lot from Mark. Whatever else medical ethics or palliative care is, it must have something to do with the practice of clinical medicine or at least it should. So I thank you very much for, for your attention here. I'm happy to take any comments or questions that you have. Okay. The biggest problems are our cardiologists who are uncomfortable turning off the machines even when the patients or their surrogates want it. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, I think that's really changing and um, I, maybe it's just our institution uh, but I think that as palliative care, as ethics in general, is really becoming more of an issue for cardiovascular practice, that people are getting a little bit more comfortable with that. Uh, I think the younger generation, um, I worry sometimes, you can see, this is actually is a picture of when I had my aortic root replaced, and I was in the hospital, and so I was kind of on the other, the other side of the, I, and I, nobody came up to me and said, you know, when are you leaving the ICU or, or something like that, but that's because... I work there and they know me. But I, I get a little bit worried that maybe we're sort of pulling, the, pulling things off a little too early um, in the next generation. But I, I don't think that's the main reason that I'm less worried about that, uh, about people being, uh, there being discomfort with discontinuation. Um, and I, I think that, I think in general, um, some of what happens is I, I just put this thing in and now, you're, now you want to turn it off. Like what, what are you thinking? That doesn't make any sense. Um, Part of what is going to be interesting going forward is if you are in a situation like that and palliative care and ethics are trying to support the autonomy of the patient and the physician is still uncomfortable, whether it's because I just put it in and it doesn't make any sense or I feel like this is physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia, how is that interaction going to happen? And we're actually, uh, from the ACC, trying to involve a um, 
get a discussion uh, through a survey of, of, of members of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine uh, to really talk about their interaction with cardiologists. What are these barriers uh, to providing palliative care in general, not just uh, deactivating devices? I'm hoping that we'll get some good information about that and I can give you a better answer next time. I, I wish we had data, we, we don't. And um, to my understanding, nobody has really done sort of a more qualitative and focused group thing or done that and then done more of a quantitative look at, at why people are uncomfortable with that. I, I think it, my impression, it has to do with this constitutive nature that people really feel like this is keeping the person going. And in a sense it is, but so is a ventilator. And so is dialysis. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't have a good explanation for why, other than maybe again it's the internal versus the external thing, something that looks like it's applied because it's sticking out of their mouth. Um, or you have to hook it up. And so it, it's, we, we began to sort of look at that, but I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done to explore that. Everybody says, and other people have shown this too, there is no choice. The person's dying, we're putting it in. Um, and a lot of these are because in the prior era they were doing crash and burn patients, now we're doing patients who are not quite as sick and are not dying. So there is a little bit more of a deliberative process. But most of the time, by the time they get to the advanced uh, mechanical circulatory support center, they've already made that decision. So they're going to have it. So I don't know if that's, I, I think it's still useful to do something like that because They'll be prepared when those decisions come uh, later on down the road. For defibrillators and pacemakers, uh, particularly defibrillators, I think there is a chance. And as you know, there's, there's a lot of decision aids out there trying to help people understand, well, only one out of eight people will actually get a shock that saves their life. Most people think it's at least 50% or 100%, which is not true. Um, and this many people will have inappropriate shocks that they don't need and yet it's painful and all that. And th those are fine. I think decision aids are wonderful but they don't really address advanced care planning. So I, I think that that might even be a better way to allow the patient to make value concordant decisions about defibrillators than our traditional you know, sort of way of presenting the data about how many people will benefit and how many people won't. So yeah, I think there is a chance for that happening. That's another thing that we're, we're sort of cook, uh, kicking around as a potential project to look at and one of the outcome measures would be how many people decide not to have it. So first of all, I actually, and I'm sorry, I, I definitely um, didn't convey my personal feelings about that too. Um, I, I was attempting to present an argument that actually is not mine. I also don't think that we should consider um, national coverage decisions and, and money and all that when we're at the bedside talking about patients. Dan has written an extremely other eloquent uh, article arguing against bedside rationing and I fully support that. Uh, concept. I, I also think that we, we need to, I think we need to kind of, and other people very much disagree, but I, I think our duty is to our patients, first and foremost. Uh, but that the argument is very much out there, nonetheless. Um, in, in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, what was your second uh, point again? I remember the third one. The battery. So there, shorter battery life. So there's many things in that. Right, right now there's a lot of discussion about this idea of not replacing uh, the pulse generators. Now it's very easy to replace them, it's not a huge surgery, um, but there, there now is a need for a discussion about really before it goes in, what are we going to do? Are we going to replace this when the battery wears out or not? And sometimes we can predict that it's going to wear out sooner than later depending on how much pacing is happening or whether it's backup pacing or whether they're going to get defibrillated or all, that, all those sorts of things. Uh, but that is very much a conversation that's having now. And again, we may look at this in a very broad sense and saying replace, not replace, turn off, it's all ethically similar, but it feels very different. Um, there also are, uh, and something else that we've sort of looked at is, what about reusing pacemakers? The battery life is not 100% anymore, but many of them have lots of, the, of uh, battery left after they're taken out of somebody who's just died. Um, why not put these in really old people? It'll make them feel better for a while, and then you just don't replace. Um, and then the third thing is, in some cases, you actually want to replace because without the pacemaker, they are really symptomatic. And they may not die, but they're going to feel awful. And so that may be actually a palliative measure uh, that actually needs to happen uh, with these patients. So that's kind of the, the way. Does that, does that make sense? When you make the decision. Absolutely. And, I, and I, I should have shown this, but there actually have been studies looking at what happens when people have their pacemaker function turned on and off with their ICD, and there really is no difference in time to death. 
So it, and it, but it probably even in that study, it's really variable. So again, this would be the underscoring the point that I would make is that if you as a cardiologist or I as a cardiologist go, okay, they're off in hospice or palliative care has them now, I'm done, that's a very irresponsible thing to do because they still need guidance about these, these issues. They're not gonna interrogate the pacemaker and figure that out. I need to do that or have that done and then give them that information so that a, a decision can be made. It's gotta be a partnership. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused about some of the comments that were made about uh, with holding uh, life, life support system. It seems like uh, with the pacemaker, there's, we're concerned about that, and with the ventilators, it's not. But from talking to people that I've seen in that, that there's a lot of concern about whether you turn off a ventilator or not. If somebody in the family, even if there's an advanced directive that's complaining, the hospital is not going to probably do this. There's going to be some questions. So it's, I got the impression, I don't think it's that easy to turn off life supporting uh, uh, devices. Yeah, yeah, so that's really getting at this issue of, of unilateral uh, deactivation, unilateral DNR, unilateral withdrawal of really anything. And I think it does become very complicated. And uh, you know, I wish that we'd actually ask them that question about, so if it's not right to turn off a pacemaker or defibrillator against patient or family's wishes, um, is it okay to do these other things like withdraw the ventilator? Um, I, I suspect, although I don't know, that they would be more comfortable with that than they would with turning off the pacemaker. I, I should defer to Dan on, on this answer, actually, because he's thought about this more than I. But I think there is. Actually, when I was uh, the chief cardiology fellow here, I invited uh, a, a philosopher to come down and talk about the meaning of the heart in Western uh, literature. And so he gave this very long and very eloquent discussion about the meaning of the heart and the centrality of it and the, thought, and the way that we've thought about this over time. So I think you are, you know, when patients come in, well, my ticker is not very good. You know, I understand that I'm sick. On the other hand, I think now recently we're getting much more of the sense of we have all these bells and whistles and toys. Why can't we keep the heart going forever? And in some cases, if we slam somebody on uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, we can completely take over their circulation. Now they will probably die of sepsis or something else, but we can keep that heart going. We can replace it with the total artificial heart in some cases. All those patients don't do well, but we can do that. So on the one hand, we have this interesting paradox. People understand it when their heart's not working. It's central to existence. On the other hand, there's so much we can do to keep it going. I think patients are, are very confused in how they're thinking about the heart these days, and rightly so. Well, as long as he's a thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Appreciate that.